I'm glad to be here. You guys glad to be at church this morning? Good. As Jared said earlier, well, first of all, I want to say, I told him his material is getting better and better. I don't know if you've noticed that. I mean, he's, he's got a real act going on. But my name is Nathan, and uh, I'm the uh, BCM director, as he mentioned, up in the Tampa area. And so for those of you that aren't familiar with what that is, we're Baptist Collegiate Ministries. And here's the great part about being a part of a Southern Baptist church is that you cooperate with Baptist churches across the nation in order to pull resources to fund ministry across the nation, across the state, ultimately across the world. And so we're a part of that. We carry out ministries on the college campus. We're afforded some privileges as a student organization. So we function much like a youth group. That's just kind of the best way to explain it on the campus of the University of South Florida. And uh, we have some other ministries at the University of Tampa, uh, Florida Poly and Lakeland, and there's some others that we're involved with. We're trying to start some things down in Sarasota and Bradenton. We've been in conversations about that. But we uh, do evangelism on campus. We're trying to reach out to students that come there for classes. And then we also do um, discipleship throughout a student's time um, they are getting their education. So we do Bible studies and worship services and, and all kinds of things. So it's a great privilege for me to be a part of that. But I just want to say thank you because whether or not you realize it, as I mentioned, we're pooling resources. So all of you, if you're giving to Sarasota Baptist Church, are a part of that as well, just like you're part of other ministries that are being carried out by Baptists across the world. It's really a great thing to be a part of the Baptist family just because ministry is multiplied more than you could ever imagine or accomplish on your own. Um, so I'm glad to be here. This morning we're going to be in Psalm 103. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. We're going to be in Psalm 103. The title of this morning's message is in the, the handout that you got. So this is kind of a neat thing. There's some points there. So if you've got a pen or a pencil or something to write with, some of the ladies may have mascara, you can go ahead and take notes in those blanks. And I'm going to give you what those are. This is going to help us kind of walk through the passage. Um, hopefully we uh, finish on time. I have no idea. Uh, they didn't give me a time limit, so we may be here all morning. I don't know. But uh, there is a lot here in this passage. I'm excited to walk through Psalm 103 with you um, this morning. And so as you see on the sheet, the title of this morning's message is Worship God, My Soul. Worship God, My Soul. Soul. And before we read the passage, I just want to say this. We did just worship. We sang to the Lord, and that is a part of worship. Throughout the Bible, people sing as a means of worship. But worship is more than that. It's not just singing. Worship is the attitude of our heart and our soul. It's the way that we serve others in the name of Jesus. It's what we saw on the video with the students that went to Peru. They were worshiping God in the way that they were taking his good news to people who may not have ever heard it. And we have been called to worship. And in Psalm 103, we see David commanding his soul to worship God. And so I want to go ahead and, and read. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read the first five verses, and we'll talk about that, and then I'll read the rest later on in the message. But there's a lot just to pull out in these first five verses. So I'll try not to do. I know Pastor Mike sometimes, he's got so many points, right? And he'll just stop midway or he'll try to wrap it up. I mean, he, he does it amazingly. We'll try to get through all of it. So here we go. Psalm 103. Let me read it. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. All right, let me pray and we'll be dismissed. Uh, I'm just kidding. That's good, right? Like you could just, we could just read it over and over again and talk about the blessings of God and how we can worship him. But I do want to pull out a couple of things. And, and what I want to say first is, is what's amazing about this is that David will command worship at different times throughout the Psalms. Of course, he was the leader of the nation of Israel um, in, in the Old Testament. And so he would command his people to worship. David exhibited worship. But what's amazing about this passage is who is he speaking to? He's speaking to himself. He's speaking to his soul. He's saying, don't forget to worship God. 
In other words, he has to fight for this. This isn't something that just automatically happens. He is commanding his soul not to forget the worship of God. And in his wrestling with himself, he reveals a couple of things. And, and, and I, I want to walk through how do we develop a heart attitude of worship that it's exhibited not just in our song, but in our service and in our lives throughout the week. How, how is worship on our minds and our hearts and our souls? How is it what we're exhibiting all the time? But first, I, I want us to pull out just a couple of things that help set this up. And, and this comes from the text, but here's the first thing, and it's on your note sheets, the first thing to write down. But the aim of all things is to worship God. The aim of all things is to worship God. It's, it's not to build a career. It's not to have a successful family. It's not to make a lot of money. It's not to graduate with honors. Now, all of those things are important, and they're especially useful if they're seen in light of worship to God. Our lives are ultimately about making much of God. That's what it is to worship. You know, it comes from the old English worth-ship to attribute worth to something. And when we say worship God, there is no one worthy of more honor and worth than God. And this is ultimately what we've been called to. Now, you can try to live your life apart from that, and many people do, and it's oftentimes the case that we fall into the trap of not worshipful, not being worshipful in our lives. But it's like... I don't know if you ever try to do a puzzle without the box, and you just kind of look at these individual pieces. Has anybody ever tried to do that? It's really difficult, right? And you're trying to make sense of these pieces, and if you don't know what the puzzle is, it can be very frustrating. And you might pull up an individual piece, and you'll see colors and lines and shapes, and, and you just go, I don't know how this makes sense. But if you have the box, it makes sense. And worship to God is like the picture, and our lives are these individual pieces, and we try to make sense of them sometimes, but when we see that our purpose is bigger than ourselves, it's not just our individual piece, but it's about living our lives for God, all of a sudden it makes sense. And there's purpose and joy in pursuing what God has laid out for us. In Isaiah 43, 7, God speaks of Israel, and he speaks to really all of those whom he has chosen, and he says he has created us for his glory. In other words, created for him, to make much of him. And we see this pattern over and over again. So David says in verses 1 and verse 2, he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. We could just walk through the Psalms. I was kind of just flipping through even this morning and looking at the Psalms around Psalm 103. And you see this over and over again. So Psalm 100, it was quoted earlier in the service. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Psalm 101, I will sing of the steadfast love and justice. To you, O Lord, I will make music. You could flip to Psalm 104. We see the same language. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. Psalm 105. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all of his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. And I'll just do one more. I could go on for a long time. But Psalm 106. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is. What's the next word? Good. David says, bless the Lord, oh my soul, bless the Lord, oh my soul. He's speaking to his soul, and then as the psalm progresses, we didn't read this part, but at the end, he then commands all of creation to worship the Lord. Verse 20, bless the Lord, oh his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his host, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, and catch this, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. What are the places of his dominion? Look at verse 19. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. God deserves worship from all of creation, from all of you. He deserves worship because of who he is. We're going to look at these benefits that are listed in verses 3 through 5, but understand that your calling in this life and where you find fulfillment and joy is ultimately to make much of God with your life. 
That is where there is satisfaction and contentment and purpose. He says, worship the Lord. Do it in song. What a beautiful thing to come together and sing together. I love the songs that we sang this morning. And I always have appreciated that. As Jared mentioned earlier, I interned here uh, a long time ago. I don't even remember now. It was probably 12 years ago. And uh, I remember even then just thinking about the celebratory nature of worship at Sarasota Baptist Church. We have something to celebrate. And when I hear other people singing or when I see other hands raised or when I see other people coming and, and lifting up their voices, it's a reminder that just as God has been faithful in my life and deserves worship from me, he has been faithful in the lives of people all around me. He is a big big God. In fact, in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, it says that people from every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every language will be gathered in heaven. What will they be doing? Praising God. They will be worshiping God. We have been called to worship. This is our great calling. Above all else, we've been called to worship God. Now, I want to show two potential problems. We see one in verse 1 and one in verse 2 that sometimes distract us from worshiping God as we should. So here's potential problem number one. Superficial worship. Superficial worship. Again, David, verse one. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. This is not surface level for David. This is at the level of his soul. This is who he is, and he's commanding him at the very inner being, at, 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 at the core of who he is, he's saying, worship God. This is not a performance for David. This, this is who he knows he should be and who he has been called to be. It's, it's very easy to put on a mask and, and to come on a Sunday morning and to sing a song. And, and, and I'm glad that you're here. Like, that's a great thing. And this is the place to come to if you're struggling with worship. But sometimes the week's been tough and, and it's so hard to muster up the strength to worship God and, and, and we can so easily approach it as just a surface level thing. Uh, Michelle and I, before we moved to Tampa, we were living in Mobile, Alabama. And I don't know if anybody has been there or heard much about Mobile, but there's a lot of neat things about it. And one of the things that's their claim to fame is that it is the birthplace of Mardi Gras in America. So when you think Mardi Gras, you think... Exactly. Uh, and Mobile is bitter about that. They started it in America. So the French discovered Mobile first. They started Mardi Gras. And, and every year uh, in January and February, they have all kinds of activities for Mardi Gras. So it's such a big deal in Mobile that students get a week off from school to go celebrate Mardi Gras. Now, I don't know if you know anything about Mardi Gras. That might not be the best idea. But students get a week off of school. And they go and they attend these parades and adults go to galas and all of this. And, and here's the thing that's really popular is they form all these different societies. And as a part of those societies, they dress up and they take part in the parades and that sort of thing. And so you don't know what's really interesting. You don't know anything about who's in these until Mardi Gras rolls around. Like nobody talks about it. I, I don't remember hearing anything from anybody about how they're a part of a society or anything like this. And then it comes Mardi Gras season. And I see my friends on Facebook that are a part of our church who are wearing these costumes. And as a part of their costume, they would wear a mask. And I'm looking at the picture, I'm kind of like, you know, struggling with it. You know, who, who is that? Who are all these people? And then you slowly begin to realize who they are. You're like, oh, that's so-and-so, you know, from church. And that's, that's so, oh, I know that person, you know. And you start to recognize who they are behind the mask. And what the Bible tells us about our worship is that it's not about the facade on the outside. That is simply a manifestation of what's happening on the inside. When you take the mask off, who are you really? Jesus warned us against a mask-only type of worship. He said in Matthew 15, 8 and 9, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And listen to this next phrase. In what do they worship me? In vain do they worship me. The word vain there has to do with emptiness. There's of no substance. It's, it, it's, it's simply just lips moving. It's not about the heart. And he says it's vain. And Jesus does this over and over again. In the Sermon on the Mount, he, he talks about all of these things that we do. We mentioned prayer earlier and fasting and giving to the needy. And what does he say over and over again? He says, when you, he says beware of practicing your righteousness before others in order to be seen by them. 
He says, because then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Now, we have to make sense of that. Our lives and our worship should be exhibited in all that we do. He says in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine in such a way that people would see your good works and give glory, worship your Father who is in heaven. But Jesus says, when you give to the needy, don't even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be done in secret. And your Father who sees in secret, he will reward you. And it's the same way with worship. Jesus is saying, Listen, you, you can have the outward performance, which is good, but we are in danger of making it a superficial practice. God is more concerned about your person than your performance. He wants your heart, not just your lips. Here's the second potential problem. Second potential problem, misguided worship. He says in verse 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Now, this should cause us to stop with caution and go, why is David saying this? This is a man after God's own heart, as he's described in 2 Samuel. And yet he says, don't forget his benefits. Most people believe that at this time, David was towards the end of his reign as king. He's towards the end of his life. And so being at that point, he's able to look back on all that God has done. And he sees the way that God has been faithful in his life. But here's the other thing David sees. He sees the moments in his life where he's made the decision to go and pursue something else. Because David did that. A, a lot of times it's recorded in Scripture that David did the wrong thing. And he pursued sin. And he didn't pursue the will of God. And so David is, is wrestling. He's saying, don't follow these other things. Instead, remember what God has done for you. Remember the work of God. Worship Him. He is worth all of these other things will ultimately let you down. My wife and I, on Sunday mornings, we teach the students at our church up in, uh, in Tampa area. We live in Riverview, and we go to uh, Bell Shoals, and we teach the students there. And um, one week, this was last uh, year, we were walking through the passage of Exodus 32, which is the story of the golden calf, which is the most unbelievable story. If you ever feel bad about yourself, you read that, and you're like, man, these people are really dumb, right? <laughs> like... God has just saved them. He's giving them the law miraculously. Like all of these things are happening. And then they make a golden calf. And the worst part about that is Moses goes to Aaron and says, what are you doing? You know, you, you're not thinking. And Aaron goes, I, I don't know. I just threw gold in and this calf came out. It's like, okay, <laughs> no, no sense, right? But we were talking about that story and how, you know, we just, we desire to worship something. And it makes sense because God made us that way. God made us to worship, and so in our class, we started listing out all of the things that people pursue, sometimes in place of their relationship with God. And so we listed all of these things. Maybe it was a, a car, or it was your career, or it was school, or it was money, it, it, relationships, whatever. And we listed out all of these things, and I'm completely out of this exercise. I just asked them to list everything, and then I said, okay, now, how can those things let you down? Let's just start. Let's just go down the list. Can those things let, and I was kind of nervous, because when we started, I was like, I hope we can actually find something wrong with all of these things. Like, I don't want them to say something. You're like, oh. But I said, let's, let's figure out, can these things let you down? And so we began to work through the list. And it was so easy for these students. Well, relationships, of course. People are sinners. They make mistakes. We're, you know, they're not always going to be perfect. Money. Somebody's always going to have more money than you. You can't buy everything with money. You can buy possession. But, you know. And they just went through the list of every single thing. I mean, it wasn't even hard to do this. All of these other things, all of these other pursuits will ultimately let you down. We see this over and over again in the Bible, but I want you to see it in Psalm 78. This is the story of Israel. It, the author here walks through the history of Israel and God's interaction with them, and he says something about their sinful tendencies. He says later on in the chapter that God gave them up once they started to pursue idols. We see that in Romans chapter 1 as well. But it gives a reason for why they did that. Verse 10, it starts by saying this, They did not keep God's covenant, but refused to walk according to His law. And then listen to this, They forgot His works and the wonders that He had shown them. Now again, just like with the Israelites and the golden calf, you're going, seriously? Like, I've never had the Red Sea parted for, for me. I can't get traffic to part. You know, let alone the, the, the Red Sea. I didn't have bread fall down from heaven. 
It's unbelievable the way God worked in their lives, and yet they forgot. And if they forgot, how easy is it for us to forget? It says in verse 42, they did not remember his power or the day when he redeemed them from the foe. We could go to Romans 1, but just for time's sake, well, you, you can look that up later, but, but it's the same thing. It talks about how God, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God, and they became fools. They were darkened in their understanding. In other words, they forgot. They started thinking about other things. And then ultimately, what did they do in verse 23 of Romans 1? It says that they pursued other things instead of the creator. They, they wanted other things. They, they gave glory to the creation rather than the creator. There's two potential dangers. One is misguided worship. The other one is superficial worship. So David charges his soul to remember the goodness of God. And I want you to see this really one word that could summarize the application this morning. How do we live lives that honor God? How do we develop a heart attitude of worship? Here's the word. Remember. Remember. Take it to heart, the work of God. So three things. I'm going to just give the, I'll give you the first one here and we'll walk through this. And then we'll see what time we have afterwards. But remember the work of God and worship him. Remember the work of God and worship him. So David, in verses 3 through 5, he, he lists out all of the blessings of God. Now, some of you, you remember going into a job interview and you maybe wondered not just how much you're going to get paid, but what are the benefits? Do I get vacation days? Are you going to help me with my retirement? Uh, what's the sick leave package look like? Are there holidays that I get off? You know, you want to know what are the benefits. And what David lists here is the ultimate benefits package. We've already read it, so I'm not going to read it again, but we'll just kind of walk through these. He says, he forgives all of your iniquity. Notice this at the end. Whose iniquity is it? It's yours. It's mine. It's our iniquity. And yet God forgives some of it. No, that's not what it says. He forgives all of your sin. And you think, how, how is that possible? You know, you may have come in here this morning and, and maybe you're here for the first time and you've never received the love and forgiveness of God. And so you're hearing this and you're like, what does that mean to be forgiven? Could God really forgive all of my sins? I mean, you know nothing about me. Right? But the promise is that God forgives all of your sins. In verse 12, it says that as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Now, if he had said the north from the south, you can imagine traveling around the globe. If you were going north, eventually you would end up going south. But he says it's as far as the east is from the west. If you start out going east, you never stop going east. In other words, there's no limit to the love and forgiveness of God. You are never beyond salvation. And what's remarkable is that it's your sin. It says in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In other words, we don't worship him as we should. And it's our sin that separates us from him. And yet God, through his son Jesus, it goes on to say in verse 24 that we are justified freely by the grace of God, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. In other words, God sent his son Jesus to redeem us out of the consequences of our sin. Jesus came and lived a perfect life. He never sinned. And yet he suffered the consequences for our sin. The Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of God. He took upon himself our sin. When Jesus died on the cross, it wasn't arbitrary, it wasn't by chance, it was planned beforehand by God that he would take upon himself our sin, our punishment, the consequences that we deserve, so that by raising again from the dead three days later, God proved the sacrifice worked, that it was sufficient for our salvation, and if we would simply trust in that, 
he would forgive us of our sins. In fact, in Romans or in 1 John 1 9, it says this. Most of you probably know this verse. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess, in other words, if you believe that God really made a way for salvation, that God sent his son Jesus to die for you, and you're willing to turn from your sin. You're willing to grab a hold of what God did for you, and you confess that, then God will save you. He will save you this morning. He will save you tonight at your bedside. If there you remember and you are convicted of sin and you just say, God, I need you, he will save you, and he will forgive you from all sin. Now, here's the remarkable thing, that if you've already received God's love and forgiveness, two verses later in 1 John, in chapter 2, verse 1, John, or John says something that's just remarkable. He says, I write this so that you will not sin. In other words, this isn't, you know, he forgives all your sins. Okay, now I have license to go do whatever I want. He says, no, the knowledge of forgiveness of sin should spur us to worship him, just as David does here. It should spur us on to love God more because of his great grace towards us. He forgives us. Here's the second thing. He heals all of your diseases. God heals us and he asks us to pray for healing. God is the great miracle worker. For some of you, that healing was yesterday. For others of you, it's today. For some, it's tomorrow. For some of you, it will be when you cross over into eternity. But the promise is that God will heal us of all of our diseases. He does a work, a miraculous work, in our lives. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we are promised an imperishable body when we enter into eternity. Praise God that he heals. He forgives. He heals. He redeems. He redeems your life from the pit. As Michael mentioned, Pastor Michael mentioned earlier, sometimes, you know, we just, it's hard to get up in the morning. Sometimes things are just hard. We have a tough week, and the promise is that God is redeeming those moments. He's redeeming us out of the pit, and he does this specifically in two ways, and they correlate with the first two things. The one, he forgives us. Verse 24 again of Romans 3, he, he justifies us freely by the grace that is it, by the grace of God through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. He redeems us and forgives us of our sins. But then he goes on in Romans chapter 8, and he talks about the redemption of our bodies. He says, and not only creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. God is redeeming us not only in the past out of our sin but he is redeeming us for the future for all of eternity with him he forgives he heals he redeems and then fourthly he crowns us he brings you into his royal family god as as the ruler of his kingdom he welcomes us in as children and heirs and and he crowns us it says with steadfast love and mercy and to those there is no end. In Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, it says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. So my son Ezra is sitting in the second row, and oftentimes when we go out uh, wherever we are, our children, they'll see something that they like, and they want me to purchase it for them, <laughs> right? Now, my wife and I, we do budgeting, and, and so we use our cards for certain things and then we have discretionary spending and we carry around some cash i was gonna see if i have a wallet back here and so i i got stickers on there from my daughter but we uh we carry around some cash and so if i were to open up my wallet right now i've got let's see i got 36 dollars okay 36 dollars and there's some quarters in there too now i don't know if you know this but you cannot buy everything with 36 dollars and some quarters right? Things are more money. And I try to explain that to my kids. That I don't have all the money in the world. And then they come back with, well, why don't you just use your credit card? You know, so <laughs> well, that's, that's true. I guess that's true. I guess I could use that. But, but I don't have all the resources. Like money can be a great aid to buy things, but eventually it runs out. Nobody in here has an uh, infinite amount of money. But to God's love and mercy, it never ceases, Lamentations tells us. He crowns you with it so that it goes on and 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 on. It just keeps going. His mercy and his love never cease. God crowns you 
with that. David says, don't forget his benefits. And finally, the last one, he satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Wow. Those are the benefits from the Lord. And that's not even all of them, right? Paul, I'll read one more verse. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power, listen, at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Church, remember the work of God and let it spur you to worship him. Worship God. He deserves your allegiance. He deserves your life for all that he's done for you. He forgives, heals, redeems, crowns, satisfies. God is all over your life if you've received his love and forgiveness. And if you've not yet, God has still been good to you. To think that you ended up here this morning to be among God's people and to hear his word and about his forgiveness of sin. In fact, I'm, I'm walking through the Sermon on the Mount right now with some of the students that live at the BCM, and, and I just, um, we've just started kind of finishing up chapter 5. And Jesus says, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. He says, so that you can be like your Father who is in heaven, who makes his sun rise on the evil and the good, who makes it rain on the just and the unjust. In other words, God has been generally good to everybody. The fact that you're alive and that you have breath and that you're here. Think about the work of God. Take notes. If you don't journal, write down things that God is doing. Remember what God has done in your life and worship him. Tell others the great news of God. And then let me do two more things real quickly. Remember the work of God. Remember the word of God and worship him. Remember the word of God and worship him. So I'll try to fly through this quickly, but this is what it tells us in, in 103, starting in verse 6. David, reflecting on not only his life, now moves to reflect on the work of God in other people's lives. And just as God's been faithful to David, he's being faithful to others. But what's remarkable is the way that David knows that is the word of God. He knows the history of Israel, and he's able to quote something. In fact, verbatim, he quotes something from Exodus 32, which is the golden calf story. It says, the Lord works, verse 6, righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. Verse 8, this is the verse from Exodus 32. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. So he quotes scripture, and then, this is great. David doesn't just skim over the passage or reading the Bible. He takes time to really think through this. So verses 9 through 14 are really his reflections on what has already been said in the Word of God. Starting in verse 9, he says, He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. David is simply just meditating on the word of God. Remember the word of God. Let it sit in your soul. Let it work through your mind. Work to memorize scripture, even if it's just little chunks of, of Bible verses or even just phrases or, or things that you can take with you that remind you of God's faithfulness. John Piper, who's a, a pastor, he's, he's actually not pastoring anymore, but was in Minnesota and, and uh, now does DesiringGod.com. You can, you can find his resources and all of this. But he says this about reading the Bible. He said, we should always read God's word in order to see his supreme worth and beauty, his glory. There may be a hundred practical reasons, good ones, that we turn to God's word. This aim, seeing God's glory, should be in and under and over all of them always. He says, when you read the word of God, you're not just picking up things to live by, which, which yes, there are hundreds of good reasons to read the Bible, but he's saying, listen, through all of those things, we worship God. We see his beauty and his glory in the way that he works in our lives. Remember the word 
of God. My wife and I, we just got back from uh, a trip. We, we went on a cruise last week. So we got back Friday, just a couple days ago. We are celebrating, not yet, so I'm not sure if you should clap yet. We're almost there. It's about 10 days away, but our 10-year anniversary. Okay, so that's kind of a big deal. Um, I'm excited about it. But we're almost there, and so we did the cruise, and one of the things about a cruise is it's very hard to get internet. I don't know if maybe I just don't have the right plan, but, you know, I can't get internet, and they offer internet packages for the cruise. So I don't know if you know, you know people can pay by the day and all this, and, and you get, so we didn't do that, mostly because you saw I had $36 in my wallet, <laughs> and so we, we, didn't do the, we didn't do the internet, but, uh, but still, you know, we're, we're sitting on the deck, and we're looking out the ocean, and just, I don't even know how many times we just said, wow, this is so beautiful, right, the ocean, and seeing it. Now, a lot of people got the internet package, and it's okay if you've been on a cruise, you get the internet package, it's not, you know, whatever. Just don't let it keep you from seeing the beauty of the ocean, right? So people get the internet package, and people are on their phones, and, and they're doing different things. I noticed one time we're eating a meal, and we're close to the windows, and we're looking out, if you've never been on a cruise, so they make the dining room really nice, and so my wife and I are dressed up, and we're having a, a good time, and we're just talking to each other, and we're out in the middle of the ocean, uh, and we're just appreciating all of it. And then I noticed that a family sitting next to us, there's four of them, there's the parents and two children, and all four of them are looking at their phones. They're not talking to each other. They're not looking out the window. And I'm thinking, you're, you're missing the beauty of what's right there in front of you. It's totally missing. Again, you know, get the internet package, whatever. Just don't do it at dinner. And so... <laughs> But they're, they're missing it. We can read the word of God and we can just fly through it and we can just check a box and go, okay, I know I had to read this passage today and you just kind of work through it, check the box, I'm good for the next day. No, 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 no. Slow down. Digest the word of God. Read it until you see the beauty of God. Read it until you are full of worship. Take note of what you see. Sometimes that means circling words that that appear and stick out to you. Sometimes it's just noticing patterns in the Bible. Why is the author choosing to write it in such a way like this? But allow the word of God to drive you to worship. This is what David does. He's, he's just working through the text. Worship God. In, in Psalm 1, 2, it says, Blessed is the man, and it, and it says all of these things that he does not do. He doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, all of these things. But then in verse 2, it says, that his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on it he meditates day and night. Jesus said, blessed, is, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Do you hunger for the word? Eat it up and, and, and partake of it and worship God. And then here's the last thing, and I'll close here. Remember the worth of God. How many of y'all guessed that it was worth before we got there? And y'all already have that, you know, I'm gonna, I didn't mean to alliterate. I don't try to force it, but sometimes it's just really easy. Word, work, word, worth. I'm just saying. Okay, so remember the worth of God and worship him. It says this in verses 15 through 18. He's comparing his frame and the frame of humanity to who God is. And he says in verse 15, As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place and its place knows it no more. David says man is frail. His life is fleeting and easily forgotten. We are here for but a moment. But he says of God in verse 17, but the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children and those, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. God is faithful, his love is forever, and his kingdom is fixed. And so David, recognizing the worth of God, does what? Worship. So we already read verses 20 to 22, but he says, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, and finally, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Let the worth of God, let his work, let his words drive you to worship him. This is what you've been called. This is your highest calling in life, is to make much of God. I'll close with this story from the New Testament. In Luke chapter 5, there's a story where Jesus is teaching at, the, at Lake Gennesaret, and it says the crowd is so large they begin pressing up against him, and so Jesus has no choice but to jump into a boat 
and teach from the lake. And he's out there with some of the disciples. At this point, they hadn't made the decision to follow him. Jesus is just meeting them. One of them is Peter. James and John are out there. And Jesus teaches them. And when he finished teaches, when he finishes teaching, he looks at Peter and he says, cast your net to the side of the boat. And we know the story well. Peter kind of doubts it. Are you sure? You know, we've been fishing. We haven't caught anything. And Jesus, just do it. So they cast the net over to the side. And there's so many fish that they can't even pull it up into the boat. So they have to call in another boat. And together they're pulling up all of these fish that they caught. And it says that all of them that were there, they were, the Bible uses the word astonished at the number of fish. They were amazed at the work of God that just took place. And this was Peter's response. He falls down on his face and says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. He recognizes the worth of God. And Jesus says, for now on, you will catch men. And it says that they left everything and followed him. What does it look like to worship God? What does it look like to give our lives in worship? We will sing and we will serve. But it means recognizing the greatness of God, our fallenness, and going all out for who he is. Saying, I will leave everything and follow you. This morning we are going to sing and we're going to worship. And for some of you, 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 you may not sing when you come on Sunday mornings because your heart is not full of worship for God. But I charge you this morning, remember the goodness of God. All those other things will let you down. He does not leave you. He does not forsake you. He is faithful and he is here and he loves you. So in just a moment, there's going to be some pastors that stand up here in the front. And I would encourage you that as we sing, that you would be so bold if this morning God is convicting you. And you'd say, I realize my sin and my brokenness, but I realize the greatness of God that he sent his son to die for me and to give me life. And therefore, I'm going all in with him. And I don't care who sees me, but I'm going to walk up. I want to grab a pastor. It's such a burden. I want to talk to him about what it looks like to follow Jesus. So if you would, will you stand as I sing? Or as I pray? I'm not going to sing. I will sing, but not yet. Will you stand as I pray? Let's get that right. Father, I thank you for your love and your grace. And Lord, I will sing because I love you.